Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Faculty Club Night. My name is Rhonda Rosen, and I am the Programming and Exhibitions Librarian here at Hannon Library. On behalf of our entire outreach team, I welcome you to virtual Faculty Pub Night. Tonight's Faculty Pub Night will feature Professor Samuel Pillsbury, Professor of Law at Loyola Law School, who is going to discuss his recent publication, Imagining a Greater Justice, Criminal Violence, Punishment, and Relational Justice. Before we start, I would like to dedicate tonight's program in memory of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I would like to just read a very short quote from her. She said, quote, to make life a little better for people less fortunate than you, that's what I think a meaningful life is, is what is. One's lives, one lives not just for oneself, but for one's community. So just wanted to uh, dedicate that to a very great lady. Um, so uh, I want to remind everybody that um, Faculty Pub Night is the library's privilege to showcase our faculty's accomplishments, to, and it's to students, staff, faculty, and during COVID, to anyone who has Zoom. So please spread the word. Um, some ground rules for tonight. Uh, we will be recording this evening's presentation, and it will be available on the library's YouTube channel. After Professor Pillsbury's presentation, I will have a short one-on-one -on -one conversation with him, and then we will open it up to questions from the audience. If you have a question for our speaker during the presentation, you are welcome to submit it by using the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. All questions will be compiled by our outreach team and then submitted to me, and then I will ask our speaker as time permits. So let's get started. Samuel H. Pillsbury is pre professor of law and Frederick J. Lauer fellow at Loyola Law School here in Los Angeles. He teaches criminal law, criminal practice, and American legal history. A nationally recognized scholar in criminal responsibility, punishment, and emotion and the law, his previous books include Judging Evil, Rethinking the Laws of Murder and Manslaughter, and How Criminal Law Works. In 2019, he wrote a research paper entitled, What is Relational Justice? After college, Professor Pillsbury was a reporter covering police and courts in North Florida. He then earned his law degree at the University of Southern California, where he graduated first in his class. He clerked for U.S. District Judge William Matthew Byrne, Jr., and served as an assistant U.S. State's attorney in Los Angeles before going into teaching. He joined the Loyola Law faculty in 1986. In 2006, he was ordained as an Episcopal deacon. He has volunteered as a chaplain in L.A., juvenile detention halls and jails, as well as prisons in California and New York. He has also worked with survivors of homicide and families with loved ones in prison. To exercise his creative muscles, Sam Pillsbury has also written two children's books, The Invasion of Planet Wampeter and its sequel, Mission to California. Please join me in welcoming Samuel Pillsbury to Faculty Pub Night to discuss his recent publication, Imagining a Greater Justice, Criminal Violence, Punishment, and Relational Justice. Thank you so much, Rhonda. Um, really appreciate that, and, uh, and particularly the uh, dedication to um, Justice Ginsburg. I thought I'd talk briefly about how I came to write this book and touch on some key points and then conclude by perhaps reading a passage from it. So I've spent most of my career as an academic writing about crimes of violence, uh, about their definition in law, about the culpability of wrongdoers, and about their punishment. Maybe eight years ago, I started thinking about writing a book that would bring together all of my own experiences in criminal justice, including my days as a newspaper reporter and trying to write something that might change how we think and talk about criminal justice. There were a number of challenges in putting this thing together. Uh, one was voice, which is always important in writing a book. I was committed to making it personal, drawing on my own experiences as a reporter, prosecutor, 
professor and jail chaplain, but I wasn't sure how I was going to be able to match that up with the bigger picture justice concepts that were at the heart of the book. Another challenge was structure, how to develop ideas so that the book had a sensible beginning, middle, and an end. And then throughout, there was the challenge of trying to define this rather slippery concept of relational justice, uh, which is my main contribution to the conversation about criminal justice. <clears throat> I found the solution to these challenges by focusing initially on the experience of those who have suffered violence, either to themselves or to a loved one. I did this because listening to their experience, listening closely, teaches us a great deal about who we are and who would like to be, which also therefore teaches us about what we should think about in terms of what we want justice to be. Now to explain just a little bit about this thing called relational justice. It's possible that you have noticed that ours is a somewhat divided nation these days. Instead of just disagreeing about a few issues that then get resolved or put aside, we seem to be in powerful and personal disagreement about just about everything. And the personal nature of these disagreements is such that the allegiances for different sides <clears throat> seem to override even the issues themselves. Yet none of the really big problems that we face see climate change, criminal justice, COVID, are going to be solved unless we find a way to work together. So what are we supposed to do? Well, I have a thought. Maybe we should reconsider our ideas about who we are and what we owe to each other. We need to think a little bit about identity, who we are, and then justice in terms of obligations to others. We Americans love to think about ourselves as autonomous. We believe that each of us gets to choose for ourselves who we are and who we have relationships with. Meaning we don't have to care for anyone else. We don't have to care about anyone else unless we want to. But does life work this way? Is this even possible? <clears throat> Murder and sexual violence, the, the two big criminal violent wrongs, are devastating because they destroy relationships and because they damage the ability of survivors to make and maintain relationships. These wrongs show us that who we are in our essence depends on connections with people that we love, which is perhaps no surprise, but also on connections with people that we don't want to have anything to do with. And that is an ugly surprise. Speak with most survivors of violence and you'll see what I mean. The fact that we are inextricably connected with others in the community, that they affect us and we affect them regardless of our desires, <clears throat> creates a basic moral obligation to avoid harming others. Each of us have an obligation of moral regard for members of our community, to see their uniqueness, to see the uniqueness of the other as a human being, and to look out for their basic good. This obligation is violated dramatically in crimes of violence. It's also violated sometimes in our own responses to violence. We always need to consider the relational effects of our conduct. For example, tackling race discrimination can't just be about blaming those who have done something wrong or said something wrong. It also has to be about changing deep-rooted patterns of relationship, including between persons who don't want to be in relationship and persons who don't think they are in relationship, but actually are. Another example is punishment. Our basic model of doing justice by convicting and incarcerating for long-term individuals who have committed serious wrongs is faulty on a number of levels, one being that it does very little for the relational healing of victims, which I think is what they need most. 
Also, it assumes that once a sentence is ordered, our relationship with the offender is over. Except, think about this, except that what happens in prison is absolutely our responsibility. We pay for it. It's done in our name, according to our laws, and therefore we have to answer for what happens to prisoners. Our prisoners with whom we actually are still in relationship. Now I want to read a, just a little bit from the book. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry for the cough. It's a bit of a lingering remnant of our fires of last week. The passage I'm going to read now is from chapter five, it's, its conclusion. And it has to do with mandatory life sentences in California. The uh, focus is on those sentences for juvenile offenders, which were enacted by proposition in the year 2000. Coming out of the Barry J. Nydorf Juvenile Hall in Silmar, California, in the early evening, the last of the day's light still held in the sky above the mountains to the north, and the night's cool yet to descend, we headed to the dark parking structure where our car waited, and it struck me suddenly and hard what the boys we had just spent the last hour and a half with faced. What it meant that they faced life in prison. The boys, 16 and 17 years old, black and brown, who were impulsive and giddy, cautious and curious, quick to anger and yet also sensitive, shut down and open, selfish and generous. They were all of these different things in their different persons and quicksilver moods. These kids faced a journey into California's adult prisons that threatened to take most or even all of the lives they had just begun. For some reason, it hit me then that they faced life inside and that this was exactly what the people of California wanted. I understood why they were gang members, most of them, many charged with murder as either the perpetrator or an accomplice. Most would be convicted by guilty plea or trial in accord with modern due process. They would then appear before a judge to be sentenced by a law interested only in their crimes. <clears throat> they would face a law that declares if you do this crime, you do the time, no matter your age or personal history, first degree murder equals life imprisonment. And how do you defeat that equation? My wife, a licensed clinical social worker, and I, as a volunteer chaplain, had begun a program which we called Strong and Free Inside for those in the compound at Silmar where juvenile boys in Los Angeles County being tried as adults are held. The program combined emotional skill building with spiritual exercises, discussions, and a bit of music. But at the time, I was not thinking about our program, but out about a legal system that I knew well or thought I did, except now I was seeing it from a different perspective, not as set out in statutes or in court decisions, but as a middle-aged man trying to imagine an entire life in confinement. I felt frustration that the public and its representatives could not see what my wife and I had seen inside. As a former prosecutor, I was aware of the limits of what can be gleaned from a prison visit. The kids in the compound in their county issued sneakers, sweatpants, and white t-shirts were not as they had been in their neighborhoods, drinking and drugging and all G'd up, meaning armed, living a self and other destructive lifestyle. But still, what we had seen was real teenagers so enthusiastic about singing the old gospel song, O Freedom, that they shouted it out at the top of their lungs and wanted to sing it over and over again. Kids who missed their own families, parents, brothers, and sisters, and for some of them, their own children. These were young people who in many cases were still trying to comprehend 
what they had done to bring them to this place. None of this would be seen by the law that would determine their futures. It would be deemed irrelevant. And I think I'm going to read one other passage, which sort of takes the other end of the uh, life cycle, which has to do with rehabilitation in prison, or what I call redemption. We can talk all we want about how we can save money with less incarceration without, without sacrificing public safety. But basic change in American punishment practices requires meeting the gut level sentiments that support the lock em up enthusiasm of modern voters. They are bad and dangerous and should go away forever. Ultimately, punishment must be framed as a justice question. We must ask, can the harsh treatment of all these past wrongdoers for such long periods be justified? Now, many see this as a quite hard question. In general, I see there being two different kinds of hard questions. The first is where we don't have enough information or there are conflicting values. In these situations, it can be genuinely hard to know what is right. The second kind of hard decision is hard, though, because although it's pretty clear what we should do, we really don't want to do it. It would threaten our most treasured relations, our self-esteem, the feeling of friends and family or peers. We really don't want to do what we should. It would cost too much, so it becomes unthinkable and a hard decision. With respect to offender redemption, there are truly hard decisions about whether an individual offender has changed. But there are also many decisions that fall into the second but I really don't want to do that category. The offender makes a valid claim for redemption that we do not want to grant by virtue of his past crime. Too many on the outside are still hurt and angry about what happened before and to, to allow a release of the offender regardless of personal transformation. The most powerful force pulling ex-offenders back to their old offending lifestyle, I believe, is not friends or family or drugs or money, but the belief that they have no real alternative. That regardless of how things may work for others, they have no chance at a good life. No matter what they do, they will always be the have-nots, scrapping for remnants left by the haves. If they play by society's rules, they are doomed. If they don't, they may be doomed as well, but at least for a time, they can live free. The best way to break this mindset is to prove it wrong. Those we have put away for punishment must be given a chance to change, and those who have changed, we must welcome back. Justice requires it. And so now I think we are turning to our question and answer portion of the program. Hmm. Yes, we are. Okay. Uh, I am... I am. Okay. Can you see me? You're all set. Okay. Looking good to me. <laughs> I'm not sure if our audience can see me, but uh, that's okay uh, too. Well, someone will let us know if you want. Yes. Um, okay. So um, because we have a lot of students in the audience, I thought that I would just ask uh, one of my type, favorite type of questions, and that is about your journey to where you are today. Mm -hmm. And I noted that in your bio that after graduation, you went down to North Florida to become a reporter on a crime beat. Um, right. And then you went to law school. And I kind of was wondering, did you, when you grad, got your undergraduate degree, did you think you were going into journalism 
or did you always know law was there and that's what got you there? Or how did that journey go? Okay, good question. Uh, one of the things I often tell my students is there were three things I was pretty sure about after I graduated um, from college. Um, one was that um, I didn't want to go to grad school. Another was that I didn't want to teach. And a third was <laughs> I definitely didn't want to do law. Um, so that just shows you how well I had a set of, of what I was going to do. Um, no, I wanted to be a reporter because it was one of the ways, particularly back then, to make a living writing and getting out and seeing the world. And we actually ended up in Jacksonville, Florida, and I ended up as a police and then courts reporter totally by accident. Um, well, not totally by accident, uh, but um, we bought an old van, um, uh, Linda and I, and we took 95 South. And we um, and I started um, calling at newspapers, uh, and I got a job in Jacksonville, and they stuck me on the police beat. And I, I think after a little while, they decided that you know this Harvard grad probably wasn't the best fit for a Southern police department, so they <laughs> put me over onto the courthouse beat, and that's really where I fell in love with the law, and um, that's why. And the rest is history. The rest is history. That's it. <laughs> Um, okay, and then the other part of your bio, of course, that I want you to talk about is when you temp temporarily filled in as a chaplain in upstate New York with a predominantly black inmate congregation. And what struck me from what I read in your book is um, the importance of acceptance that you felt. Right. So again, you know, sometimes the best things happen by happenstance. I was taking a sabbatical in the Albany area. Uh, where my wife's family is, and I was working on this book, and I realized that I still wanted to do some volunteering, um, if I could, in jails, and I got in touch with the state prison system. New York, New York State has a bunch of upstate prisons. Uh, I think the expression being sent up river comes from New York, um, and uh, it turned out that one of the local prisons, um, the Protestant chaplain, um, really needed some help. Um, he needed some fill in uh, because his wife was very sick and I was like ready to go. Um, and so they just thought that was great. Um, and so I started doing it and um, there were some initial glitches because um, one of the things in jail and prison, there's a big divide between Protestants and Catholic. Uh, and so I needed to assure them that I really wasn't Catholic, that I counted as Protestant enough. Episcopalians can kind of go both ways. Um, and uh, but the other piece of this really was the idea that here was a white guy coming in. It wasn't all black, but it was predominantly black. Um, and really right from the beginning, they were just taking me as I was. And that was enormously gratifying to me. Um, I did a Martin Luther King celebration, which they'd never done before. And, and that seemed to go really well. Um, and at, by the end, they were they, they really seemed like they had had accepted me. Um, uh, and I mentioned at, in our very last session that, you know, I, I really appreciated it, even though, you know, I was white and, uh, and not like them. And, and one of them said, yeah, and, and you're really white, even for a white guy. <laughs> I just take that as it is. <laughs> so it was important that you were listening to them as much as they were listening to you. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the magic of chaplaincy when it happens is that the ordinary barriers between people fall away. And so actually in my work, I think I worry a lot more about education and class and race and age differences than the folks that I um, encounter. They don't care about that so much. Um, they're really hungry for somebody who is willing to see them as they are and the other things are very much secondary. Okay. Um... So let's see. Okay, so the whole idea of relational relationship justice, uh, relational justice, is it being taught in law schools now across the country now? Is it something new? Is it unique? So the, the term that many people here, I'm sure, will have heard is restorative justice. And restorative justice is being taught in a number of places, although a little bit haphazardly. Um, we have taught it at the law school in the past, but we're not really doing a good job of doing it now. Um, restorative justice is the idea that we want to um, bring all of the players in a dispute situation to the table, meet in a single location, work through what has happened, and try to repair relationships by 
um, admissions and uh, and recognition of people's pain and coming up with a plan of action for uh, making things right. Um, I call mine relational justice because I want to give it a somewhat broader idea that this is something that may inform our legal system because restorative justice is often seen as kind of a substitute for or alternative to legal justice and particularly for the most serious crimes I don't see us going there. Um, and it's a way to emphasize this idea that we are all of us in relationship with each other in ways that we don't often want to acknowledge. Got it. Um, so what would it take to reform our penal system to bring about the three kinds of healing of communities, victims, and wrongdoers? Well, that's a good question. Um, and it would take a cultural change. It will take a change in how we view things, which is why I'm so ambitious in this book to talk about uh, this idea of identity. Um, we can see this happening in particular communities. Um, I mean, one, one example, we recently had the anniversary of 9-11. And I often talk to my students that this was our modern greatest collective experience of violence. And you'll notice that we've done a lot um, in response relationally to that. We have a whole big museum, um, constructions in New York City. We do memorials all the time. We had a very big compensation fund. Um, it's part of something we talk about all the time. We have the Memorial Park in Pennsylvania that just opened. Um, this is what it means to really deal with um, the harms of violence and to mourn victims, to seek, uh, to seek their healing, bring them back into community. And you'll notice there that there's been very little in the way of formal conviction and punishment. We still have the whole Guantanamo thing going on. So I think it shows you how much we can do that does not depend on our conviction punishment model. Hmm. Okay, so we now are in the cell phone era. What role has the prevalence of cell phone footage played in the courtrooms? Well, it's actually not so much in the courtroom, uh, although it's important there, it's really in the public. Uh, and I think it's been absolutely transformative. I mean, anyone who was, lived in LA back in the early 90s remembers Rodney King. And how did Rodney King happen? Somebody got a new video camera which was a relatively new consumer item at the time, and was just playing around with it and shot the film. Uh, and since then, of course, cell phones and their video capacities have become ubiquitous. And for the first time, we can see what actually happened. Because in the past, all of these cases have been, you know, have been brought to the legal system in different ways, but they have rarely been taken seriously as they should have because it's the police officer's word against someone who um, the public may have some reason to discount. Um, and it's just, you know, um, well, maybe it happened and maybe it didn't, we don't know. But when you see the footage, now you start to see this is real. Um, and it's not new, but it is a revelation for much of the public. And that I think is starting to change a larger views of the system of the police, and we'll just have to see where that actually takes us. Um, so at one point in your work, you talk about having a day of remembrance where we recognize our past and its impact on the present. What day would you recommend? It's a wonderful question. I, I, I saw that in your list of questions earlier, and I've been thinking about it, and I have no answer. Um, <laughs> because because ideally it should be a day that really has historical resonance um, uh, for um, events in the past. I mean, maybe it would be the Tulsa um, race riot massacre, um, but there have been, many, maybe it would be the draft riots in New York City. Uh, many people don't know what that ha about that. That was uh, during the middle of the Civil War, um, uh, whites attacked blacks throughout New York City because they were upset about being drafted into a war that they felt was going to be fought on their behalf, and they didn't like that at all. Um, so maybe one of those kinds of days uh, would work. Um, in, um, uh, but I, I don't have a, I, I don't have one that just sings. Well, and what would a day of remembrance look like to you? 
Well, you know, in Israel, they stop uh, one morning um, a year um, uh, for a period of silence, um, and the entire nation stops. People stop That's in nice. traffic, or they, they stop in stores, in schools. Everyone stops to observe this just moment of silence. It's not a holiday, right? You don't have sales. Uh, you don't have special NBA games. Um, uh, it is just a time when you really take that seriously. Uh, I think that would be just wonderful if we could do that. Um, we're a ways from getting there, um, but uh, one nation that, and this has often been um, discussed in recent years, that Germany has taken remembrance extremely seriously. And there were memorials all over Germany uh, about the Holocaust and the, um, and the crimes against Jews and others uh, during the Nazi era. And we just haven't done that uh, with respect to race in this country. And yet there's such a rise of neo-Nazism. Neo it's never done. It's never done. Yeah. Um, okay, one last question, then I'll turn it over to the audience. So at one point in the book, you say that race is the ghost in the machine of American justice. But some have argued that the race is the machine itself and that the whole system needs to be torn down and rebuilt. Is a complete dismantling of our criminal, criminal justice called for? Is it possible in part? How can we most effectively exercise, exercise the ghost? Good question. Um, on the, in the scheme of reformers, I am not among the more radical who would be um, in favor of dismantling the whole thing. Um, I have to say I've been part of it. Um, you know, I've been a prosecutor um, and I, I've, I've worked for a judge and, and, um, and I, I see the danger of throwing everything out um, as being pretty significant. Uh, democracies uh, fail when they fail to do, um, the, fail to provide public safety. And our, our democracy has been failing for a long time for a segment of our population, um, but it has to function for everyone and the dangers of throwing the whole thing out are very significant. Um, one of the things that's really hard, I think, for many people to hear who are really committed to, to radical change is the extent to which police have to be part of the solution. Um, I've just never seen it work anywhere without them being a part of it. We may, you know, be able to start over in terms of hiring, as in, say, the Camden, New Jersey department, uh, but they have to be a part of it. Um, and when police decide they're going to defect in place, which is one of their tactics uh, for resisting um, any reform, it can be bad all across the board. We've seen that in Chicago, seen that in Los Angeles. Um, and so, this is again part of my relational justice idea. We are in relationship with each other. There is no deciding that some people we're just never going to deal with you anymore. We're not gonna to listen to you, you go away. We're all part of this and we all have to listen to each other. And so, um, you know, I think we've made some significant progress in LA with LAPD, but recent events have shown that we have a really long way still to go. Um, but we're not back in the bad old days of the early 90s, um, and we have another generation's worth of change that we need to take on. Great, thank you so much. So I'm gonna turn it over to the audience. Uh, first question is, are there successful programs for juvenile offenders that address these issues? And could you describe one? Yeah, there are. Um, and uh, one of the, th one of the th uh, so there are, um, so-called camps um, in LA County. Um, and several of these have really been transformed by volunteers who really provide significant, um, uh, significant resources in terms of rehabilitative programs. And uh, there are other, uh, Missouri uh, as a state has done an excellent job of really, of really reconfiguring how they do juvenile justice. Um, Juvenile justice, more than other parts of the system, has attracted attention because there is something about kids that people still uh, think that, you know, oh, they can be redeemed, they can be changed. Uh, and so I think that's one part of our system where we really have made major progress. If you look at how many kids were locked up in L.A. County in the 90s and how many are locked up today, it's an, an enormous change. Um, and uh, far less in terms of uh, being charging um, and the um, extreme penalties. So I think it's an area where 
we're really starting to, to, to do things right. In LA County, the big problem, frankly, is institutional. It's the LA County Probation Department, which is one of our more troubled uh, law enforcement um, agencies. And I think pretty much everyone would agree with that. Hmm. Thank you. Um, let's see. I'm curious if you could speak to the severity of criminal law punishment compared to relaxed enforcement of white collar crimes. White collar crimes? Or yes, white collar crimes. crimes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wait, there's a little bit more. How does this impact the broader inequalities of the system and or reinforce these notions of helplessness where they have not, you mentioned in your second passage? Um, so one of the big equality questions has been, continues to be, does everybody get treated the same for similar cases? One way that race uh, and class discrimination plays out is by um, treating uh, different criminal categories differently, right? So that the crimes that certain groups are more likely to commit get treated more severely than other kinds of offenses. Um, it, it, the discrimination occurs in terms of what is brought to police attention. Um, and so um, over the last generation, the treatment of white collar offenses has actually become much more severe. And this is something that, that happened basically after I was a prosecutor. Uh, and so in some ways, the punishment system has leveled up uh, to increase punishment for everyone. But I, there's a big pushback um, that's going on now. I think we, had, we saw significant evidence of that in some of the treatment of the defendants um, coming out of the, uh, the various investigations, um, uh, the Mueller uh, spinoff investigations. Um, and uh, the, the piece that I really worry about here in terms of discrimination, uh, whether it occurs in terms of treating different categories of offenses um, differently in ways that may not be warranted, or treating different offenders differently, um, is something that I call in the book mercy discrimination. And the way this works is some people just get straight law. And so if you ask about what happened in the case, the decision makers say, oh, well, that's what the law provided. They committed the crime. They get the punishment, of course. Whereas there are going to be some other cases in which, well, you know, this seemed like a good guy and he hasn't been in trouble before. And, you know, this exceptional case. And all of a sudden we're individualizing and all of a sudden we're granting mercy. Who gets mercy? Who gets law? We often see a class and a race distinction there. Hmm. Okay. Um, next question is, oh, just move that on me. We hear moving stories of the victims of violent crime or their survivors who forgive those who committed the crimes. We also know that some victims and survivors want the perpetrators to be imprisoned for life or perhaps executed. Should or how should the feelings of victims and survivors versus the decisions of the people be taken into account in a system of relational justice? Really good question. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things that we really have not figured out um, because I think we're still in the early stages of hearing victim voices. W what happened in the late 20th century was from my perspective, the whole victims' rights movement was um, in some ways co-opted by the tough on crime movement. Um, and it isn't that the victims who were giving strong voice to um, a, their desire for strong punishment were in any way um, insincere, but they're not always representative. The thing to remember is that there is no such thing as a singular victim response. You'll see death penalty cases where the family is seriously divided. Some of them will say, you know, absolutely not uh, for the death penalty, and some will say, absolutely, we want it. So what we as a society have to do is to continue our process of listening more carefully to victims than we have in the past, because in the past, the system really has not done a good job of that. But we also have to understand that the ultimate decision has to be a public one, um, and not just dependent on the particular views of victims, because that can skew the system very badly. Um, and also to, to, you know, one of the things I, I get 
disturbed by is when I see and hear uh, prosecutors particularly essentially selling victims on punishment, that that's what we can do for you, that's what we will get, we will get justice, that that is justice, um, without understanding that there's a lot of other things uh, that we might call justice as well. Hmm. Um, somebody asked, how can we prove transformation to the system? Good. You can't. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, this isn't provable. Uh, and, and you just have to recognize that that is the case. Uh, that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. And what I think we need to do is just be pretty hard nosed about looking for the signs. Um, there are some there are some good reasons to believe that someone who has been in prison, say, for 15 or 20 years and is now in their late 30s or, or 40s is likely to be a pretty different person than they were at, you know, 17, 19, 22. Um, we know statistically that the chances of, um, of committing significant crimes declines very significantly as age goes up. And we look to see the signs of, you know, is this person uh, managing well in, in prison? Are they doing programs? Um, um, do they seem to understand what it is that, that they did and the harms of that? There are, there are ways to do this uh, that I think can be fairly reliable. Um, but, you know, let's, let's not be, um, uh, let, let's be clear, uh, we don't have proof the other piece of this that's very difficult for most people to understand is that, relatively speaking, long-term prisoners, who particularly are likely to have committed murder, are among the least likely to recidivate. Um, the folks who are the most likely to commit another crime are those who have done, you know, a year or two in prison, are still young, still have a drug problem, still are engaged in the lifestyle, um, still are going back to that same community without having undergone a transformation. So is our penal systems what needs to be changed? I mean, are, is that where more occupational training needs to be? Is that where giving people a chance needs to be focused on? It needs to be everywhere. It needs to be everywhere. Um, another piece that we haven't talked about, which is really important, is mental health. So um, the, uh, the numbers of people in jail and prison who have a very significant mental health diagnosis is very large. Uh, and in jail and prison, they're mostly given maintenance at best. Uh, so they're, you know, their medications are maintained, but uh, very little in the way of really effective therapy is provided. And I don't think actually it would be terribly expensive to do it right, uh, but we're not particularly interested in doing that, nor do we provide that in outpatient programs. Um, certainly vocational uh, training is really useful. One particular example has come up here in California uh, where there has been a program for inmates to fight fires. Um, yeah. And they, ha they have to have you know, done a lot of qualification to get out there on the lines and they do that. Um, and then when they get out, they say, well, hey, I wanna fight fires, this was, this was great work. And they're disqualified um, because uh, you, it, their, their felony conviction means they can't even really apply. Mm. There's recent state law that, that's modifying some of that, but there's a lot of that everywhere where um, we're really not giving people a chance to make it on the outside because we're so committed to the idea of once a criminal, always a criminal. Right, right. Which brings uh, me to one of the questions. Um, let's see. Oh, I've heard very little bit about Norway's criminal justice system. Do you have any thoughts on how or whether that system approaches the model you're discussing in your book. Okay, so um, there was a really interesting documentary, I will not be able to pull out of my head the name for it, um, in which I think it was one of uh, a Norwegian warden, it was definitely Scandinavian, came to the United States and took a tour of uh, upstate New York prisons and talked about all the different things. And it really was very good. Um, there is a lot to be learned from the Scandinavian countries and also a lot that just isn't going to transfer at all. Um, small, homogeneous um, countries um, are very different than our very heterogeneous um, uh, mass society. Um, but, you know, the basic idea of respect 
for inmates uh, and not engaging in shaming um, and in trying to um, uh, allow them to live a normal life uh, in which they can have decent food and live in decent surroundings makes a great deal of sense to me. Um, I remember hearing um, the uh, former warden of uh, uh, the Florida Penitentiary, um, Rayford, uh, talk. Um, he came to prison work totally by happenstance. Um, and they just needed prison guards. He started working, and soon he was in charge of a, of a dorm of a, of a unit, and the unit had far less disciplinary violations than anyone else. And he was called in to explain this to his lieutenant, and then he said, "Oh yeah, well we've learned a new language. Uh, it's called please and thank you." Oh. Simply, simply treating inmates yeah. with respect, um, and they, they really appreciate that. When I, talk, it's, when, it's I talk guys, you know, when I talk to guys in jail, um, the thing that, they, that I can feel has the biggest emotional punch is them getting disrespected all the time. Uh, Which brings me back to the, the chaplaincy and the, the importance of listening to each other. I think that goes hand in hand with that. Um, so someone uh, asked, um, should relational justice be an issue in the race for Los Angeles County District Attorney 2020? I hope so. Um, one of the um, one of the things that we really do a very poor job of is um, dealing with um, offenders who are charged with offenses who want to apologize. And this is one of the places where I think relational justice could really work. Um, if you've been hurt by somebody, whether it's a traffic accident or a crime, <clears throat> To have that person say, you know what, I'm sorry, um, is very powerful um, and often much more important than the amount of money that you get or the amount of time that this person receives as a sentence. So, you know, it happens with some frequency that a defendant says, you know, yeah, I did it. And I'm really I'm really sorry for the family. Uh, sometimes it's their own family, of course, that's the victim. And the way our system is structured now, both prosecutors and defense attorneys, um, really is set up to, no, we don't want to hear you do that um, because the lawyers like to be in charge and we're going to say everything and, and the defense attorneys don't want to give up anything on liability and prosecutors don't want to give up anything on punishment. But if we had a district attorney's office that was a little bit more open to this, um, we, it's not an easy thing to manage within our system, but to have that as part of the way we dispose of cases at guilty pleas and sentencing, uh, I think would make a, a real difference in how the system is perceived by everybody. Um, I think you touched on this and you may have sort of answered it, but how do you know when someone in confinement has changed or is worthy of redemption? Well, I mean, the, the thing that we really have to focus on is giving people a chance. And I think that's the big, the big issue. So, you know, um, the way the prisons usually work is the higher level of security that you're at, the less programs you have, which means that the people who actually need the most programs get the least programs. Um, and there's even some evidence that for low level offenders, um, intensive programs actually does more harm than good. I'm not sure exactly why that would be. Uh, but the key is giving people a chance and, um, and to understand that, um, of course, we're going to make mistakes, but the biggest mistakes um, aren't probably going to be on the release decisions. Uh, it's going to be in other in other places, um, including what we do after release, uh, the extent to which we have a release process where there is um, supportive supervision as opposed to just punitive supervision, uh, where basically um, either there, there is no there, there is no follow up at all or it's it's it, it seems to the person released very um, restrictive and punitive and they're just never given a chance at all. Can you take one more question? Sure. Okay. First of all, someone in chat says the documentary about Norwegian criminal justice is called Breaking the Cycle. There we go. Isn't the crowd great? You yeah. just outsource it and there it is. <laughs> okay. Um, let me see if I want one of my questions. Uh, 
Okay, I'll let go out. Um, let's see. What can we do to equalize the differentials in sentencing from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, judge to judge, with regard to those who are currently incarcerated? Well, that's a tough one. Um, one thing that we have to really realize is that our, our criminal justice system, and I put it in quotes there because it really isn't a system, it's just a collection of a bunch of different pieces, um, is very decentralized. Uh, much more than most other countries. So most other countries will have a, an essentially national system whereby they're, they're directing um, policy from the national level. Um, in the federal government, it only applies to federal cases, which are a small minority of all of the, all of the cases. Here in California, um, we have a state law system where the vast majority of uh, cases are handled but each case is going to go to different counties. So LA County is a bit different than Orange County, a bit different than Ventura County. And within the county, there are going to be differences between the Santa Monica Courthouse and the Compton Courthouse and Pacoima. And, and then there are differences between judges. So it, it, it's really structured to be quite uh, varied. Um, and so the effort to uniform, to make it uniform is important, but there's also a cautionary tale here. So the federal government tried very hard to do this with the guidelines system, which went into effect in the late 80s. The problem was that the combination of the guidelines system, which really limited the discretion of federal judges and um, increasing penalties that were ordered by Congress meant that the overall punishment just increased a great deal. Judges hated it because they didn't feel like they could really do their job of individualizing a sentence to the offense and the offender. Um, and then finally, the court said that those guidelines aren't mandatory, uh, but they are discretionary. I don't think anyone really wants to go back to a really fixed system. It turned out that the uniformity that was provided um, wasn't really worth the cost uh, that went with it. Hmm. Okay, I think it's time to let you breathe a little. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to wrap this up. I think we've answered all the questions. I want to thank you very, very much. I've been looking forward to this evening for such a long time. Um, I really enjoyed reading parts of your book that I did, and I think you're a really great writer. Um, Thank you but I would like to say one lesson. Can you just talk a little bit about your children's books? What possessed you? What, what, what joy do you get? What does it do for you? Okay, so um, uh, having, uh, having children is the key to, for me to writing children's books. And uh, my daughters liked um, hearing made up stories. Uh, and uh, I came up with these characters called the Wampeters. Uh, which are rather rotund creatures who have uh, uh, enjoy food a great deal. Um, they believe that you should have two desserts, dessert to start and dessert to finish, uh, because you never know what's going to happen, right, during the course of a meal. And so you've got to get your dessert in at the beginning uh, to make sure you get it. Those are my and then, kind you know, of people. Once you get to the end, you need dessert too. Uh, yeah. So anyway, they, there were these hum humorous figures and... Um, I just had a lot of fun telling them the stories. And my wife uh, at that time had a small publishing company and we strong armed her into publishing them. Perfect. And, um, I always expect someday to get a call from Disney saying, oh yes, we want to those Wampeters, but somehow it's never happened. It could, it, it could. could. It could, yeah. who knows? Maybe this is the publicity it'll need. Yeah, maybe somebody is in the audience, you never but, know. But really, they, I, I loved writing them um, and I, I enjoy when I you hear from kids who enjoy them too. And it's really, it is an exercise of your creative muscle. I mean, sometimes you just really need to use that muscle. And I think it, it really, um, it really helps the soul. Yeah. So, um, so thank you very much. I really appreciate you uh, answering all of our questions and coming here to speak with us tonight. Um, I thank all of you in the audience, and I would like to thank our Dean, Christine Brancolini, for her continual support of the Hannon Library's fabulous programming. And I hope all of you will join us um, next week. Uh, no, next month, I'm sorry, when we will have Dr. Nina Lozano.
talking about her book, which I just oh, forgot to bring out here, which I will do now. Um, it is called Not One More, Feminicidio on the Border. And uh, that will be on October 13th. So uh, when we, when we, at the, when you pop off, you will have a very short little survey. We would love you to uh, answer and it will help us uh, plan and improve our future programming. And then finally, um, when we send you up a follow-up notice, you will all be getting uh, a 20% off coupon for Professor Pillsbury's book. And so we'd like to thank him for that option also. So thank you all, um, do come again. And I hope Professor Pillsbury, you will come back to us again. Well, I Thank appreciate you. it. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you very, very much. Bye-bye, everybody. Take care.